So let's uh, kind of get going with all that now that we got the rules behind us. Uh, we want to talk about uh, discipline this evening. And uh, so if you happen to join us, I'll be glad to bring you on board uh, whenever you're ready. Uh, but tonight, uh, discipline is the topic. And so I'm going to be talking a little bit about that as we go along. And uh, of course, if somebody comes in here and decides they want to join us and they're acceptable to, to come into the system. Uh, and I've had situations lately where people haven't been. And I've had to shut down the show or either boot the person out, you know, and that just disrupts everybody. I don't know why people do that, but I guess that's where we are in society today. Everybody is angry or frustrated or they got to do something. But anyway, I'm trying to help folks. So that's what we're going to do here. We're going to talk about discipline. So uh, let me just kind of uh, get set up here and we'll put some folks on uh, screen here, or not folks, but we'll put our program on the screen here. Um, hold on one second here. Um, now I'll pull it up and we'll talk about discipline. Discipline is an interesting topic area. Um, a lot of people deal with it on a regular basis. And um, uh, it, it tends to be a difficult situation for folks in most cases. So uh, that, that's uh, one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you about it tonight. Um, let's uh, share our screen. There we go. And I'll move me up in the corner to get out of your way here a little bit as much as possible. And we'll get over here to our first slide there. So if you're, <laughs> if, I, I love Snoopy, but if you've experienced discipline, you might have this kind of look that Snoopy has on uh, his face as Charlie Brown. Uh, sending him back to learn a little discipline. So uh, that that is an interesting thought process when you bring this topic up. People see it a lot of times um, that way. So okay, we're recording, so that's good. Uh, now, so what is discipline? Well, a good place to start definition. And uh, I always like to go there because, you know, people have looked at the word from and uh, relative to its meaning from iota of time back. So it, it's kind of always neat. So let's take a look at what the discipline uh, definition is. According to Wessler, it's control gained by enforcing obedience of or order, you know, we want to, and I love the word enforcing uh, because I, I mean, that pops up in the definition. Enforcing obedience, I'm going to make you somehow obey me. Okay. And or it could also be as part of that an orderly or prescribed conduct or pattern of specific behavior. Uh, where you're disciplined in that behavior. So, you know, using this definition, I could discipline you to ensure you adhere to your discipline of your task. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's kind of how that reads. Uh, so, now, how does, how does that happen is the, is the issue, you know? And, and I've, over the years, seen it happen a lot, a lot of different ways. Um, but generally, it boils down to a couple of ways. And the first way is some sort of mentoring approach to discipline, particularly when it has to do with employees or um, uh, some followers of nonprofit organizations or whatever. So you you could look at a mentor. And so the definition of a mentor, according to Webster, and you can see this 
uh, Odysseus uh, was an educator, and and so this is a Greek, a Greek uh, founded word. It's 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 uh, steeped in Greek uh, from its beginnings, and it, it really talks about being a trusted guide or an educator who's who's really not part of the family who's distanced from the family but truly is entrusted to develop and educate and make this happen so teachers for examples could be mentors and often are to their students out there i've been doing a lot of work looking at uh, the the role of the principal as a leader um, uh, lately in the last few days it's something I think I want to pick for one specific topic area for a show down the road so I've been doing some work in that area and uh, so you kind of see a teacher in that way you entrust your children to learn what they need to learn to be successful in the future to this teacher which really a definition for that teacher is they are mentoring your children that's a good way to think of them so when they're disciplining them, they could take a mentoring approach to that discipline. And often in one of the groups that I read, I often hear about people talking about love and patience and caring and those kinds of things when they're dealing with providing uh, disciplinary advice to others on the group. Now, or, and you will get a result from that, okay? And, and or you can use the other approach, which is punishing. And, and I think the picture, if you, you look at this definition, it's, you're, it's the act of punishing. So it's an active act. Um, uh, that's kind of strange the way to say it, but uh, it, it's suffering and pain or some sort of loss. It serves as retribution of something you've done wrong. So uh, that's what this is all about. And uh, so in this, it, it's also a penalty. So it's seen as I'm gonna take something from you or prevent you from doing something from it. And, and that's a judicial approach to it, but, but in a business or a private world, that's what's going on. You know, I'm, I'm really, taking something from you uh, or I'm preventing you from doing something and we'll see how that works in a little bit when we go back into some of the other stuff uh, that I presented early on in this series which is by the way is now on iTunes as a podcast you can actually get to the series of stuff through iTunes it's video podcast and uh, so I'm going to continue to leave it there uh, and do that. Uh, and, and by the way, when you punish, it's it, a lot of times it's severe, it's rough, it, it's hard, you know, harsh treatment of someone. And because you're trying to make a point and you're thinking that's going to help them change, if they have enough pain, they won't want to do it again. Okay, and, and in the environment of a business world or where you're leading people, where you can't threaten them. Now, if you happen to be in the military, you can threaten them with jail, but you can't threaten your employees with jail for performing poorly, for example, or making a mistake on the assembly line. And unless they hurt someone or they do it on purpose or something like that. But generally speaking, you're not gonna threaten them with uh, jail time uh, and by the way the, if you're a soldier you you can't leave you you are you are bound to the united states military uh for whatever time you volunteered for or were draft well i guess it's just all volunteer now but they you know they could have drafted me and that's how old i am but uh they're, they're there they can't leave if they leave they violate the law and can be punished judicially punished <laughs> where employees can't they can just get up quit and leave and go but some of them can't because 
that might be the only job that's around or they are not skilled enough to pick up something else. So you have this idea of leaders who feel like they can use punishments, very severe, very tough. Okay. Now, uh, so when you think about how you're going to affect change with someone that does something wrong, you can do it in those couple of ways. You can punish them, which is abusing them or chastising them or cracking down on them or dismissing them or cutting their hours or stuff or uh, threatening to do harm to them some way by degrading them in front of other people or whatever. And by the way, if you're perceived as being a, as a leader, if you're perceived as being able to do more harm than the person whom you're disciplining, it's not balanced harm potential, then you already have a block to trust between you and that person. Okay, that's why people don't automatically go to leaders because they perceive that leader has the ability to harm them more than they can hurt the leader. So that, uh, you know, you can't always rely, but leaders wonder, why don't employees come to me? That's it. That's the whole thing. They don't trust you yet. You haven't created an environment for trust. That was a previous segment too, by the way, on communication and trust. You ought to look that one up. It's a good session. All these are short. They could, we, could, we could talk for hours and hours, or actually I could consult and as a, as a, a leadership coach with you for hours and hours on any of these topic areas, but but at least you're getting a familiarization with how complex leadership really is and why I consider profession just not a job. And you could also hurt somebody. You could destroy their self-esteem. You could take away their reputation. Uh, all of those things have the resulting effect of creating fear in the employee. And that can lead to slowed work, or worse work, uh, people leaving, or even people sabotaging jobs. I, I worked for Marriott Corporation years and years ago in their in-flight division. We were sent down to in Dallas to investigate a uh, bad food situation on flights and ended up being an employee uh, that had gotten a few more employees aroused and they were all sabotaging the food going on the flights. So there's an example of how that can impact you uh, as a leader. Keep that in mind. Then you have uh, where you develop or mentor them. That's the other approach you could take, where a person feels like you're aiding them, you're helping them, you're trying to think about what's right for them. You can assist them. Uh, you can uh, show them what to do and how to do it. You can get the resources they need to do it. Uh, you can show them the benefit of doing it right. You know, when you do it right, it's easier. It doesn't take as long or there's things that are rewarding in it for you. And uh, you can help them by training them and, and uh, providing them the resources and giving them incentives and things like that. You can actually preserve them versus harming them by helping them to rebuild their safe, to heal them, rebuild their self-esteem, make them feel better about themselves, help them see that there is a future out there for them and that they are important to you and everybody else in that organization. So, you know, when they do something wrong, you have these two particular approaches that you can use. So when someone does something wrong and you need them to recognize that what they did was wrong and accept the idea that what they did was wrong. You know, you need to formulate it in a way when you put the message out there to them, how you handle them. If you want to do that in a way where the person wants to hear it, accept it, understand it, and understand the need to change. Okay, so that's very important. So you can look at these two ways and see which way that might get done. Uh, it's probably not going to be punishing, I'll tell you that. Uh, now, you will get a reaction from punishment. You will get movement. You just won't get the maximum effect that you could get as a leader. So when you do this, you've got to keep in mind there's some rationale for doing it. You've got to exhort and, and discipline people and provide them the information they need and help them grow 
with grace and concern for their well-being. Uh, that'll create a deeper understanding of the error that they've made and a stronger commitment to correct that error. And when you're explaining your rationale for change, you also have an opportunity to, and you have this kind of dialogue where they're accepting uh, the information as, from you as a mentor, you have the opportunity to check on using feedback to check on whether they are going down the path they need to go. And I have found that even when people can't make the change, when you have this kind of environment, it's easier to sit down with them and say, this isn't the right thing for you, and they agree. And then you help them out the door into something that might be better for them. And that makes every, even a separation, a disagreement and a separation a lot easier down the road. So just some thoughts for you to think about. On the other hand, Punishment in and of itself really creates fear and resentment, and that's blocking the desire for that person to change or may even convert to something worse like sabotage. And that's actually where your hostile employee comes from that comes back in and does bad things to people. So you have that kind of environment. So you think that all of this stuff is neat, it's cool, and you know, where are the books on Amazon.com and, and in the bookstores, and what courses can I take to learn all this brand new dynamic stuff about discipline? <clears throat> well, I'm here to tell you this has been around since the beginning of time. You don't have to look very far, and you've probably read this book, the a lot of this theory I'm assuming would have been generated because anybody's taking credit for it. Uh, they're, they're probably not going far enough back in time to give the true authors of this credit. And let me just kind of give you an example. When you think about discipline, there's the leader's role in discipline. And that role is actually the responsibility and the obligation to the person you're disciplining to discipline them. Here is the verse that comes out of the Bible, just one of many, but here's an example. He who withholds a rod hates his son, but he who loves him, him uh, disciplines him diligently. And that's out of Proverbs. And, um, from, and so, uh, you, you can see here, you know, um, a paraphrasing that would be is if you care about your employees, if you care about the people you lead, you need to let them want you, you. It's your responsibility to let them know what they're doing wrong, particularly if you're trying to hit goals and things like that. But it's your obligation to them to do that also so that they understand that they have a problem and they have the opportunity to correct it and get better at what they're doing down the road. At least that option is available to them that way. Now, when discipline's in play, the other role is the role of the follower or the employee. And here, this is an interesting verse relative to that. I discovered these uh, when I was coaching a vice president one time and uh, he was uh, having a lot of problems with discipline. I was explaining this concept to him, and he wanted to know where it came from. And, you know, I told him the book's on your shelf. Uh, he who neglects discipline despises himself, but he who listens to reproof requires understanding. Uh, well, not requires, acquires understanding. Really what this says is you as a person, shouldn't look at discipline as negative. And, and normally, if it's presented in a developmental mentoring role, you don't. You, sh you will want someone to tell you what's doing wrong as long as they're not punishing you for it. You will seek that information. You will want to hear that information from whoever can provide it to you accurately and correctly. You should seek that. You as a person should continually seek that. That's how you grow. That's how you develop. So you have these two roles. The leader's role 
is which is an obligation to help you by providing you the discipline, the exhortation, the development you need based to help you correct what you are doing wrong so you can be successful in the future. And the follower's role, which is you need to want to hear this information and you need to get this information so you can make the changes and you can achieve what you need to achieve. Now, so how does all that work? Uh, this is the thing that uh, finally uh, was a wake up call for this vice president. And that is uh, both of these roles are important and you need to do them, but they have to be done in a way that provides uh, the right opportunity and encourages a caring, a fostering of and encouraging a caring relationship between the person giving the discipline and the person receiving the discipline. We've already talked about those two roles. Now, the verse here is, rebuke me not in your wrath and chasten me not in your burning anger. When you're providing feedback, when you're disciplining somebody, if you're punishing them, you most likely, like that picture showed, you're mad, you're angry, uh, and you are yelling and screaming at the person. You don't want to do that. This, what this verse is saying is, this is not where you want to go. And reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. Don't just yell that they did it wrong and send them back and tell them to get it right. You need to rebuke them. You need to show them that what they've done is wrong in a way that it encourages them and instructs them on how to do it right and learn how to do it right. Okay, and you need to have patience with that. That you know, may not work the first time or two, you do, but you have to have that opportunity to allow a person to accept and hear what you're saying wrong because you're saying it and they want to hear it, when, when you allow that to happen the right way, we call that disciplining with grace, or at least that's what I call it at. And it all has been happening since the beginning of time, folks. It's time tested. And you can go through, now I use the Bible here, but you know, even if you're not religious, you can see if you paraphrase these statements and you look at this concept, it makes all the sense in the world if you want somebody to change. It's how you would want to be disciplined. It's how you would like to discipline someone else without anger, without frustration, without yelling, without screaming, without fear. Okay? So this isn't anything new. And it's exciting. Okay? Now, so... Let's go back to those power bases that I talked to you about in the very beginning, about the second or third week I started this series. And uh, let me just kind of cite some of these power bases. But let me uh, wet my throat a little bit. There, I can see them better already. <laughs> okay. Expert power. These come from French and Raven, 1959, University of Michigan, about uh, 20, 25 miles from where I'm broadcasting here in Brighton, Michigan. Nice, great little town, great little town. I love it. Uh, but these guys basically came up with the, I, these bases of power that leaders tend to use. And since the, this period of time, just to kind of catch you up a little bit, uh, these have been researched and used in, oh, since 1959 and just hundreds if not thousands of studies that validate what they're saying is correct. And some of them are against actual criteria like improved performance, improved sales, improved morale, improved safety, the whole thing. So basically what happens is, um, yeah, let me just read these to you. Expert powers, subordinates believe that the leader is knowledgeable and a component, and, uh, and I'm sorry, competent and possesses 
skills the subordinate doesn't have or, or can actually do them so much better than the subordinate. Referent power is the likability, uh, the, the, the desire for employees to want to go to that leader, subordinate's ability to establish a positive relationship with the leader. The leader is approachable, they're liked, they're easy to see and talk to. Coercive power is a belief that the leader can inflict punishment. We talked about what punishment was already, so this ought to be clearer to you on the subordinate. Now, those are the basic three approaches to power that leaders use. And there's some tools they use that they also have power, they call power basis, are reward power, the belief that the leader can provide rewards for subordinates change in behavior, um, legitimate power, by definition, the leader's position is, um, they have the right to prescribe, you know, behavior change because that person is subordinate to them and there is a hierarchical structure and it's kind of like, uh, you know, you don't salute the uh, man, you salute the bars or the insignia on them in the military. In other words, you respect the position and the title and because of that, you give that person or you grant them some authority over you. Information power was actually added to French and Raven. They only had these first five, but uh, they, uh, there was research behind that. They're very much just parallel to French and Raven studies. And the information uh, power, uh, leaders have the ability to provide or withhold information that's important to the subordinates so they can go, uh, I'll let you know that when you need to know it. So here, you know, the coercive, you, you know, the coercive leader can withhold rewards. They can use their position as a threat, uh, or they can withhold information from you. As an example, you see how those three power bases really are kind of used by either the expert and referent uh, leader or the coercive leader. Now, what we know for sure is the expert, uh, or what has been proven over time by this research, is the most highly effective uh, power base that generates the most morale, the best performance all around, the best leadership rating, if you were going to give it a rating, is the combination of an expert and referent power base leader. In other words, those two things together, someone who's very knowledgeable, understands your job, respected for understanding the job, and is approachable, likable, and, and uh, interacts with employees on a regular basis. And other employees feel like they can go to them and they respect them for their, uh, not for their position, but for their knowledge base or capabilities from that side. The least effective power base is a coercive power base. And that has proven to be uh, actually a reduce uh, and inversely related to performance in a lot of cases. You can get some performance out of people, you just don't get as much and you may find sabotage and other things, take performance, either work slowdowns, sleep ins, things like that. So, those are the power bases, okay? And so just, just to kind of reassociate you with those along the way here. So you, the leader, make the choice about the discipline that you're going to use, okay? That's your choice right now. And I, I can tell you, you make or break a discipline premise on the choices you make. So you could choose to be use the power basis of referent and uh, reward and expert power bases. I should add expert in there, uh, and, and and reward comes with that because reward is so much associated with expert referent power bases that you can uh, see how that in fact. Uh, 
leads to the developmental or a mentor position. Other employees look up to you, they know you can reward them, you can help them, you have all the power and the knowledge to help them and you're approachable and you can use those reward bases to really help them grow and be better in what they're doing. Okay, so these power bases, the expert, referent, and reward-based power bases are the power bases that most mentors and developmental people use when they're applying discipline to individuals. And it comes across as a developmental or mentoring role uh, when they're disciplining. Or you can come across as a coercive power person, someone who uses punishment uh, to punish people. Uh, in terms of getting what you want them to do. So in the end, I'm telling you how you discipline people, your choice of discipline impacts performance, morale, and the results of everything you're gonna do. So you really need to make some decisions about the disciplines. And I'm not saying there isn't a point in time where you don't have to use coercive power. For, think about yourself as a parent, okay? Uh, if your kid is about to put their hand on the stove, you don't take the time to say, Martha, don't touch the stove because the stove is hot. And if you touch the stove, it will burn your hand and then we're gonna to have to take you to the emergency room. You don't do that. You yell at them and say, don't touch that stove. <laughs> okay, so I'm not saying that you can't use punishment down the road and any of these power bases have a usefulness at a point in time. I am saying when you're disciplining and when you're leading people, we know these power bases, becoming a mentor, and a developmenter and caring for your people and going back to those uh, discussions about grace and orientation and how you do that and the need for you to understand as a person who uh, is a leader has not just the responsibility but the obligation if you care for your people to discipline them. And they as employees, if you, if you use this development and mentor role concept and discipline, they as employees will feel the desire to want to be told what they're doing wrong and to want to make the changes and, and ask you for that assistance because you are an expert uh, power-based leader and you have the ability to reward them if they get it right. They know you can help them. And that they focus more on that than they do how much you can take away from them if they don't change. So we do know all of that leads to stronger performance and better performance of people. So there's a quick discussion about leadership and we're probably pretty close to about five minutes away from uh, being where we need to be at the end of the program, I uh, knew it would take a little bit longer to go through this year. Normally I'd try to keep those to about 20 or 25 minutes, but think about this. You know, when you think about leaders you've had, okay, <laughs> people who have disciplined you, uh, you know, which, which one of those two styles, the mentor or developmentor, developmental person, the mentor, uh, the expert, uh, referent, power-based person, um, that leader, when they discipline, they're talking, uh, the environment is calm, people are, you know, relaxed so they can hear and understand what you're saying about what's wrong, and they, and then, you know, they they know how to ask questions about what they need to change and where to go to get that information and how to get the help. And you want them to be there because you care about them. You want them to be successful. Now, if all of that's happening, the rest of it comes. The improved sales, the improved morale, 
the retention of employees, less cost in hiring, uh, more uh, efficiency and effectiveness. People do things uh, faster, quicker, smarter. You have a more creative and innovative environment that comes out of uh, a relationship like this when you're in the middle of talking. So you, you can literally go in and say, okay, uh, this person did this wrong on the line, everybody get around. And, and the person is not demeaned they see they're being used to improve everybody else at the same time. You could actually do that on an assembly line and everybody, and you know, and then at the end of it, you know, pull everybody together and say, help each other, you know, you guys need to help each other. Don't let one person fail because it affects everybody. So you can create a whole and team environment around this discipline approach too. There, there's so many varied ways you can use it and be successful at it. So as always, you can go to my website um, uh, or my, actually my Facebook page. Uh, it's uh, and it's uh, facebook.com and uh, forward slash uh, leadership lost or evolving. If you go in there, you can message me if you want to be on the show as a guest. I'd love to have somebody on and just, you know, uh, take some time and we would back off some of this education and literally just get you know, your ideas of what you think's going on and what issues you would have questions about, because when that happens, then other people learn from that. That's that mentor developmental role we would be talking about. So uh, if you would like to be on the show, go, go to that website. It'll, it'll be in the description below here. Uh, and you can go there and uh, there's a little button there that says send message and arrow pointing to it and everything to help you get there click that send me the information let me kind get in contact with you and then we'll schedule you in on one of these shows and you can sit down and we can have a side-by-side -side screen set up and talk about leadership and talk about it relative to the context of your leadership issue and situation. You, you don't have to have a company name. You don't have to talk about your leader. You can just talk about the industry or whatever. Like I'm hoping to get a principal to come on with me and discuss that whole role because uh, folks, the principal's job is extremely difficult out there in the world. I'm telling you that right now. I didn't realize how much until I started looking at it. It's a very difficult job. So I'm hoping to get somebody to join me on that. We'll work on that. But we're coming to the end here now. Uh, do that. I am on iTunes. Look me up on iTunes. You can go Victor L. Vogel. You will find me there. Um, <clears throat> and you can get this whole, th that way you can sign up. And then when this, if you miss something, you'll get automatically notified that it's happening. Okay. So I hope you uh, enjoy this. I hope this discipline program helps you a lot. I uh, hope it's something you can use in the future uh, to be more successful. Till next time, I'm Victor Vogel. This is the Leadership Talk Show. Have a good evening.